Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, House leaders weigh in on their priorities for the 2018 legislative session. Minnesotans come to the Capitol to offer personal stories of elder abuse and to rally for limits to distracted driving. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. Minnesota political writers are using words like nutty and wild ride to predict the year 2018 in politics. The 2018 legislative session began February 20th and joining me in the studio to talk about House Republican priorities is the Speaker of the House, Kurt Dowd. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The February forecast is due out soon. The January revenue numbers are really good and all four caucus leaders and the governor are now predicting a surplus. How does a potential surplus affect your caucus's priorities for this well, session? I think in some ways, uh, and everybody would probably say this, some, sometimes it makes your job more difficult because when there's a surplus, there's always expectations and everybody wants a piece of that pie. Uh, the reality is I think it gives us a little more flexibility in what we can accomplish. Um, in November of last year, obviously, we had a, a, a deficit of $188 million. And since then, quite a few different things have changed that, that likely are going to bring us uh, what I think will be a sizable surplus. I think it'll be north of a half a billion dollars. Um, and I think it's important to note that that comes from uh, the federal government passing a tax relief bill, and it comes from economic growth, and it comes from uh, the economy improving uh, as a result of, of those things. And, and so those are all good things. Um, that will give us the ability to invest more money in roads and bridges if we choose to, or education if we choose to. Um, we also have to deal with the, the federal tax relief bill and, and respond to that in a way that doesn't make Minnesota less competitive. So that's going to be a challenge as well. And that's my next, my next question. Because of the new federal tax law, uh, there's a question of Minnesota conforming to the federal tax law. How big of a challenge is this going to be? Well, it, it will be a challenge. Uh, I think for, for those of us who have been watching what happened at the federal level and trying to figure out how we're going to react to that at the state level, we still don't have our minds totally wrapped around that yet. It's fairly complex. Um, but what we do know for certain is that if we pass federal tax conformity um, without doing anything else, that would be a, a huge tax increase on Minnesotans, somewhere in the neighborhood of $550 million to maybe $700 million. I don't think anybody wants to see that. At least I know I don't want to see that happen to Minnesotans right now as the economy is starting to, to take off. Um, and we do have additional revenue coming in, so it's not necessary. Um, I, I think we have an opportunity to try to, I, I think our first priority should be to try to hold people harmless in that tax bill. Um, but because some people may find that their taxes go up and other people may find that their taxes go down and it's not apples to apples, correct? Right, right. So uh, what you'd want to do was take the, the additional revenue that's coming in and try to figure out how to give it back exactly to the people that had to pay more in taxes. Um, however, it's not quite that simple because some people do have tax decreases, so you don't want to increase it on them. Um, it's not going to be easy, but uh, in areas, and, and it won't be perfect, but in areas where we can't, uh, you know, kind of recreate the, the old tax code or try to hold people harmless, as I like to say, um, I think we should have the, the priority of trying to make sure that um, we're helping the people we think either need help or that we want to help incentivize the kind of behavior that we want, uh, economic growth, those sorts of things. Or, uh, uh, you know, give the money to the to the people who we think need it the most. Uh, one of my priorities has always been um, exempting Social Security income from state income tax. We're one of very few states that does that. So those are things that make Minnesota less competitive. Um, so that would be one example. The governor has put forth a $1.5 billion bonding package, and Republicans have criticized this as being too large. The governor argues that we need these investments in infrastructure, in state assets. They're falling down. There needs to be an influx of, of funds just to maintain our state assets. Do you believe the proposal is too large? And what number are you looking at? And what kinds of projects would you like to see in this yeah. bill? Well, it is large. It's, uh, I know that it's 50% larger than the largest bonding bill ever passed. And I know that because we just passed a billion dollar bonding bill last year, which was the largest one ever passed. I do know that we've fallen behind on taking care of some of our state assets. So I would, I would always like to see uh, us invest in regionally important infrastructure, uh, water, transportation, those sorts of things, um, and then take care of our state assets. Uh, 
you know, we call it HEPER at, at Minsky and the University of Minnesota, but it's basically putting roofs and uh, tuck pointing on, on state-owned assets. Uh, those are things that we must take care of those assets. So uh, we want to make sure that we're doing that. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the forecast calls for about an $800 million bonding bill. If we have a bonding bill higher than that, we actually have to increase, uh, we have to appropriate more money to cover the debt service. Um, and, and basically that $800 million comes from uh, canceling of old. That's kind of the ongoing amount that we just typically bond for. Um, if we did $800 million, that would bring us to about the billion-dollar 10-year average, uh, billion-dollar per biennium 10-year average that we've had because we, we missed the previous biennium. Um, and I think that's probably reasonable. But I think it's more important what projects need to be done, uh, what projects can we fit in this bill, um, and I think that will kind of drive the size of the bill. Could be less than that. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, we probably can't do one larger than that, but I think we're open to having that conversation if it's absolutely necessary. Senator Horman raised the point, though, that interest rates are, are low right now, so maybe now is a good time to perhaps borrow more because interest rates are expected to climb. Do you buy that argument? Well, you know, we, we still have, I don't know what the number is right now, but it's typically somewhere between a, a billion and two billion dollars of, of money that we have authorized bonds be let, and those projects have never started. We've never let those bonds. So we have a backlog right now that probably, you know, would be a good time to start all of those projects instead of reauthorizing new ones. If we don't need those projects, if we find out that they're two or four years old or whatever and, and they're no longer necessary, let's cancel those and that might give us the ability uh, to use that money uh, to bond in the future. So I, I would I would like to look at um, why we have such a big backlog again of, of Un unlet bonds from past bonding bills. I think I just accidentally promoted her to senator. I met Representative <laughs> oh. Portman. I'm sorry about that. Um, nationally, President Trump has put forward an aggressive... We, in the House, we call that a demotion when we go to the Senate. So. <laughs> okay. um, President Trump has, is putting together or has put together an aggressive proposal for infrastructure across the country. Is uh, Senator Bach spoke of leveraging some of those resources for some of these projects. I mean, sure. we do have water infrastructure issues. Yeah. We have transportation issues. We have clean water issues. There's really a lot that Minnesota could spend money on. What's your take on, on the president's ideas I there? Think, I think we're all eager to see exactly what he's proposing, exactly how that would impact us here in the state. Um, my hope is, because of the numbers that they're talking about, it would be a significant uh, investment in, in transportation and other water and other uh, you know, regionally important infrastructure. Um, in addition to that, we did about $140 million just from the, the auto parts sales tax in the last biennium that we dedicated statutorily to roads and bridges. Um, there's about another, probably twice that, I think we used maybe a little less than half. So there's another 150, 160 million that we could take from that if we have a surplus to cover it um, to put into roads and bridges. So in addition to what the feds are doing, I actually would like to go back um, and, and dedicate the entire auto parts sales tax to roads and bridges. And, and together, you know, I think we could probably take care of uh, infrastructure, the, the backlog that we've had for the last 10 or 20 years. Speaker Dowd, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The Senate Committee on Aging and Long-Term Care met this week to hear testimony from the public on the flood of reports detailing elder abuse and neglect in Minnesota's senior care facilities. One of the first incidents that happened was I brought my brother and sister with me one night to see my mom and I noticed that um, they didn't have her pants all the way up and she was sitting in a wheelchair with a dining room tablecloth shoved down her chair to soak up the urine because they didn't bother to take her to the bathroom. Um, they just covered her with a sweater in front um, and left her like that. Um, because they didn't care for her hygiene, she ultimately on New Year's Eve, I went to see her, and she didn't look well, and I took her into the bathroom, and she passed out on the toilet, and I rang the bell for, for a nurse to come, and nobody came, and so I called 911, 
and the paramedics arrived in her room with a stretcher before anyone came into her room. Finally, because I had complained so many times, they threatened to put her in a lockdown unit that was um, for people that had severe behavior issues. When I arrived, two days of newspapers were outside her door, along with activity papers from the facility and boxes of formula supplies were stacked next to the door. My heart was pounding as I knew something wasn't right. Her door was unlocked and when I opened it, it was dark. I flicked on the light switch and to my horror, she was lying there lifeless in her lift chair. She was laying at an angle with her legs hanging over the front rest. Blood on the floor, the footrest in the back of her chair. Her entire neck was bruised, and she was wearing the same clothing she had on on Tuesday. Um, one of her hearing aids and a stuffed kitten toy I had given her on Tuesday were on the floor under her footrest. There was an odor present, and as I surveyed the room, my stomach turned. She clearly did not die peacefully. Mom had her first unwitnessed fall. I was told an aide left her on the hallway to use the bathroom. When she returned, Mom was on the floor. Mom's care plan specifically states she needs assistance from one staff while walking. Two weeks later, another call. Mom was found on the floor in the dining room bathroom. An aide brought her there and left. Her care plan clearly states mom needs assistance from one to two staff in the bathroom. One week later, another unwitnessed fall. Mom was found a great distance from her room on the floor. Two weeks later, I received a call from the police at 6 a.m. They were taking mom to the emergency room with a head injury. The staff found her bleeding, laying on the floor. The emergency room had to um, staple her head to close the wound. At a media availability, Governor Dayton was asked what needs to get done this session with regard to elder abuse. Well, first and foremost, to get on the, on the cases of these uh, care, they call themselves care providers who are breaking laws and breaking their, their moral code and a professional code by the kind of actions that are going on. And they're doing everything possible to prevent uh, the victims and their loved ones from getting information, documenting it, and getting action on it. You can fault the State Department of Health, and I have, and they, they reduce the backlog, but, yeah, and they adding more people, which were, uh, was funded in the last legislative session to do inspection, but they're not gonna be able to inspect every single nursing home and assisted care facility in the state on a, on a d daily or weekly basis. And, and that's where the focus has been so far, so be it. And there are things that uh, need to be done uh, in terms of state enforcement, but the real responsibility is with every one of those care providers that gets paid by the state and by uh, the, the residents to provide care. And, and the abuses that have come to light and there are more than out there are absolutely first and foremost their responsibility. And uh, that's where the legislation which I, they've uh, defeated last year to, to impose the different uh, pre patient protections and, and ways to find out information and ways to get immediate response. And when there are violations, that should be as, as every bit as much the focus as uh, framing the State Department of Health, which is deserving of the blame is received, but it's now it shouldn't be standing alone. The 2018 legislative session began last Tuesday, and joining me in the studio to talk about the House DFL priorities for this session is the House Minority Leader, Melissa Hortman. Welcome, and thanks for being here. My pleasure. Political observers believe the biggest tax this session is going to be tackling the issue of tax conformity with the new federal law. Will this be a big issue, and why? Well, the new federal tax bill is very complicated. Uh, I should say the new federal tax law and it was just changed even a, a couple weeks ago in the new year to correct some mistakes that were made in its rushed passage. So I think even the federal government is still sorting out what all of the provisions are and what they do. So as a result, the Minnesota Department of Revenue and Minnesota businesses and individuals and CPAs are still sorting out what exactly do the federal changes mean for Minnesota filers. 
I think we know that if we do nothing, if Minnesota does nothing this year, we, when we can't get conformity done, then the state will see an increased collection of between 154 and 200 million dollars. If we fully comply with the new federal law and nothing else, just conform, uh, we would see 700 million to 800 million in new revenue. In other words, Minnesota taxpayers would be paying 700 million or 800 million more. So just straight up conformity is not an option because it would be a, a massive tax increase. So what we'll be looking at is conforming, but then enacting tax credits and tax deductions for Minnesota filers that take away the tax increase and put them back to where they were if there would have been no federal tax bill at all on their Minnesota tax liability. So while this, the federal tax law is simplifying some people's tax returns in Minnesota, it's actually complicating them to the extent that everyone's going to be wrestling with this. Do you expect it to be a cooperative wrestling with the impacts? Well, I think there's two, two issues. One is just dealing with the complexity of the situation. I think there'll be tons of bipartisanship with regard to sorting out what is the federal tax scheme due to Minnesota and how do we conform. But then when we look at adjusting for what the federal government did, I think that's where you'll see some differences on party lines. The federal tax bill is basically a $1.5 trillion transfer from the middle class to the upper class and corporations over the next uh, coming decades. In Minnesota, I think Democrats would like to see a rebalancing towards middle class families. So on the federal level, corporations and the wealthy get permanent huge tax cuts. I think we would like to see on the Minnesota level to give some of those permanent and large tax cuts to middle class families rather than corporations. This is a bonding year uh, and the governor proposed a $1.5 billion capital works uh, projects investment package. Do you support the size and scope of the governor's plan? Yes, it's time for us to make this kind of an investment. We know that the Federal Reserve will be increasing interest rates. So we know that the cost of borrowing will be going up. So for a family, for example, that's looking to buy a house, now is the time. They want to lock in that loan before the rate goes up. The state is very similar. The bonding bill is like our mortgage. And so just like a family would in taking out a mortgage, we want to seize the low interest rates right now before they go up. And we want to lock in that rate and buy as much as we can afford responsibly and to take care of Minnesota's needs. You know, one thing we don't do that great of a job as, as a state is to take care of the assets that we already own, whether it's roads or university buildings or bridges or our water treatment plants, our sewer systems. We tend to put them in and then not spend as much time raising money to fix them as we spend raising money to do additional work. And what makes a lot of sense right now in this low interest rate environment that's temporary is that we take advantage and we fix these things in Minnesota's economy that power our state's economic growth. The other really good thing about having a big bonding bill is these are great jobs for middle class families in Minnesota. You know, the middle class has been in decline since the 1980s as we've seen the manufacturing sector decline. And we've seen the super rich and people in the financial sector, they're doing just fine. But families that uh, rely on a breadwinner who works with his or her hands to make a living, those folks aren't doing as well. And we can actually do something about that by having a good, healthy size bonding bill. Let's um, talk about any other priorities that the House CFL is uh, looking to really um, advocate for this session. Well, there are a number of, of issues on the plate, as there always are. I think foremost uh, among them would be the opioid crisis. Um, dealing with the issue of sexual harassment and dealing with the elder abuse issue. With regard to the opioid epidemic, we have a state representative who's lost a close family member. Dave Baker. And uh, tragic circumstances. We have a state senator who's lost a family member. Senator with, Chris Eaton. Right, yes. with uh, tragic circumstances. And so I think that there is bipartisan, bicameral goodwill on trying to come together uh, to get something done. Really, um, this, is a, this is a problem that crosses income lines and geographic lines. With regard to the issue of sexual harassment, obviously we have to clean house at the Minnesota legislature, right? We don't want to tolerate a workplace here that is in any way unwelcome to anybody, whether they're a reporter or a constituent or uh, a lobbyist. Everybody, including you know, members and employees and all the outsiders who come to the Capitol need to be treated well. 
But we need to take action to look at Minnesota's other workplaces and say, do people have the legal tools they need to respond if they are sexually harassed in the workplace and then demoted or uh, fired because they've complained about it? And we need to really take a look at, is the system as it exists right now protecting Minnesota's employees across the state in all sectors? And then finally, on the elder abuse issue, you know, I think many of us have had a grandparent or an aging relative uh, go through assisted care um, living or uh, end of life care. And there's nothing that uh, terrifies us more than somebody mistreating a member of our family at their most vulnerable moments mm -hmm. like those. The simple facts are we haven't dedicated enough resources to taking care of our seniors. And we don't pay the people who take care of our seniors enough. And so we have a labor pro workforce problem there. A lot of times Republicans say, well, we don't want to throw money at a problem. Nobody wants to throw money at a problem. Democrats don't want to throw money at anything either. But we do have to invest enough so that we can get good results. I know that there is a task force that's looking at that, those problems right now, and actually uh, Senator Housley on, on the Senate side has the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee. Does the House have a similar committee that's looking at those issues? The House has a similar committee, and our lead on that committee is uh, State Representative Susan Allen, who's mm -hmm. brilliant and very compassionate, and so I'm sure she's going to do an extraordinary job. We also have Liz Olson, who's got, uh, been paying very close attention and participating in this process. So I imagine what we'll do is we'll take those recommendations and we will move them forward this session. Representative Hortman, I want to thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure, and I hope to talk to you again during the session. Yes, I will hope to have you back. Thanks. This week in the Capitol Rotunda, Minnesotans for Safe Driving held a rally in support of banning cell phone use while driving, except in hands-free mode. My dad's death came at the hands of a driver who was replying to her daughter's text message. A witness said there were no brake lights and there were no skid marks. Unfortunately, an all too common theme on our roads. The driver stated, before she was able to hit send, she hit a yellow blur. That yellow blur was my dad. I'm wearing a jacket similar to the jacket my dad wore to prove how visible he was as he was walking down the county road just out in front of his house. It really didn't matter what he wore if the driver wasn't paying attention. In 2010, I was riding home from a meeting about safe routes to school with the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minnesota Department of Transportation staff when I was hit by a driver who pled guilty to careless driving and was fined $500. I spent three weeks at Regions Hospital and it cost several hundred thousand dollars to screw me back together. But I'm one of the lucky ones. I live to, to see my kids grow up. In October, I spoke with Senator Jim Carlson about his bill that would require drivers in Minnesota to use hands-free technology when behind the wheel. I began by asking him if, in his mind, behaviors like texting and talking on the phone are as dangerous as driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Driving under the influence is a, a proven um, influence on your driving and on reaction times and things like that. So it, it's been against the law to drive while under the influence for years. Now the, uh, the problem with driving with uh, an electronic device taking your attention away is it's not been found illegal or it's not been passed as illegal. And you know I passed, I managed to get a, a law passed about distracted driving enhancing the penalty when there's great bodily harm and death. And so what we had to do is we had to define it so that a person intentionally disregarded the something that they know. And the, what they know is that uh, distracted driving can influence your driving. So that's what we have to do in this particular case as well, is to uh, identify driving while you're speaking on a phone, a uh, handheld device, as being distracted. Now, 
there's a lot of you know there, there's a lot of uh, leeway in there where you know does that include uh, fiddling with your radio? Does it include driving with a hands-free device? You know those are the kinds of things that we have to address and make sure that we put some lines between them. Is there any element of this Washington law which basically just takes away all handheld activities that you would like to see modeled in Minnesota? Well, I'm not familiar with that that particular um, legislation. I do know that uh, as of October 1st that Oregon did pass something that was very similar mm -hmm. and they put a lot of teeth in their law. It's a $250 fine and on, if you have a third offense in 10 years, it can be six months in jail. So it's very, very serious. They're recognizing that this is a very serious problem. And I think all of us recognize it as well because as we drive, we see people that are wandering in their lane. They're, they're staying along at, uh, at stoplights when it's gone green. Uh, there have been many tragedies where people are not watching out. Uh, so it's, a, you know, it's something that I think people recognize and we just have to do something about it. Well, and you mentioned tra tragedies, and I think that often the impetus behind these laws is the death of someone, and then that person's family gets involved in trying to, to you know, make that loss mean something into the future. Is that true behind your effort? Did somebody lose a child or a family member? Yes, uh, there have been several people, one of them being a person that I happened to know for several years that uh, her brother-in-law was uh, tragically killed when he walked across the street uh, by his own driveway. Uh, we had the bus driver from southern Minnesota, that a retired bus driver that was killed when he did the same thing, went to get his newspaper and someone paid no attention to him being on the street and hit and killed him. We had that incident in uh, East St. Paul where a woman was talking on her phone and made a turn and ran into a child. Now, the child was injured but not, not severely. So, you know, it's obvious that people are just not paying attention. And this is a rather new thing to have telephones that you can use in the car. And I think we all know that you, you do pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the telephone and you somewhat blank out on what's going on around you. You mentioned teeth. What kind of teeth do you think legislation in Minnesota needs to make people change their behavior? That's a tough question because we don't want to make it so bad, so hard, uh, that, uh, you know, for instance, the, you know, the, law the law enforcement officer has to make a decision too. So if he sees a woman taking her kids to school on you know, eight o'clock in the morning and she chatted on the phone or maybe calling the school and telling them that she's going to be late, is that something that deserves a $250 fine? Or is it something that you know, we can have a little bit of compassion on that person? Now, if there's a, an accident, that changes the story. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.